Hey, Piro. So you brought up um, Blake Hoffman Johnson's book, Philosophy in the Flesh. And, um, you know, in terms of cognitive science, I would definitely want to, you know, I would have to put myself in their camp. Um, I, would, I would want to call myself um, one who has recognized the embodied nature of our thought, which is basically that, first of all, most of it is um, not egoically consciousness, uh, not egoically conscious. Most of it is unconscious, you could say. Though I, I want to be careful with that word unconscious because that doesn't mean we, we, or it doesn't mean that experience doesn't, doesn't occur at this non-conscious level. It just means we don't experience it as, you know, I don't experience it as Matthew, uh, as, as a, an ego, as a separate entity. Um, unconscious experiences are more, it's as though you're immersed in the reality you experience. You're not standing apart from it, um, but in fact belong to it. And that can be quite frightening for the egoic mode of consciousness. Um, so we don't pay attention to it. So when we say that, that you know, 90% of brain activity and bodily activity takes place unconsciously, that doesn't mean that there isn't some sort of experience associated with it. It just means that, you know, our rational, waking, egoic minds are too afraid of um, melting into it to ever be able to conceptualize it. Um, so we repress it and it forms the basis of our in instincts and drives um, and emotions and our will. Um, you know, because, Piro, you seem to obviously agree that this will is there. There is this unconscious sea of desire underlying all of our conscious thoughts um, and ideals. Um, but it's not free because the consciousness is totally detached from the unconsciousness. Um, I can't control my will, but my will is in control of me. Um, so it's as though, you know, we have a conscience and we may be as idealistic and angelic as we want, but ultimately we've also got to contend with this selfish, um, self-interested, um, desire-based component that wants to survive, not only wants to survive, it wants to survive in a pleasurable way. Um, at least, you know, all life, I would say, you know, we can say it survives and that that somehow explains evolution, but I think we also have to say it wants to survive. Um, you know, because rocks last for millions of years. Um, you know, crystals, elements can be, become quite complex and remain inorganic, and it somehow, at the cost of an immense uh, increase in, in the intensity of pain, inorganic matter comes to life. It begins to distinguish itself from its environment, self-organize, uh, and begin to exist in this state of, of constantly being challenged by an outside of constantly having to maintain itself in the face of something other and something alien. Um, if that wasn't also pleasurable in some, in some way, some deep way, matter never would have done that. Um, and certainly single cells would never have uh, organized themselves at a higher level into multicellular uh, creatures with, with nervous systems and complex neural ganglia that, you know, sort of all migrate to the head and, and begin trying to orchestrate a takeover of the rest of the body. Um, before that, you know, imagine the increase in pain that becomes possible after all this sensitive tissue is developed. Cells would only do that not just because, you know, it's not an accident. They didn't just happen to survive this way. They wanted to survive this way. Um, and so, you know, to bring this back to Lakoff and Johnson, when we talk about all of our thoughts being 
somehow a reflection of the way our sensory motor cortex is wired. Um, all of our thoughts are, in fact, um, deeply related to the way that our brains have embedded us in our bodies and in the world. So our concepts of space and time are related to the structures of our um, neurons, and the patterns of our neuro, uh, neurochemical exchanges. Um, that's perfectly true, but this doesn't necessarily mean that then all of our ideas and thoughts about the world are just subjective and relative because they're only based on the structure of the brain. Well, that means the brain is, is dipping into some spatio-temporal uh, continuum that we are and exist within. So our bodies are the universe itself turned inside out, or outside in, perhaps. Um, we are the universe sort of radially centrated upon itself, spatially and temporally, such that, you know, all of the genes, all of the evolutionary mutations leading up to the human being right now are present in each of us, and they reflect a cosmic memory, a planetary me memory um, within that cosmic memory that's billions of years old. Um, and also a cultural memory of, you know, symbolic meaning that uh, human beings have been able to express as somehow, you know, if human beings can express symbolic meaning, they must have been present somehow, potentially, in um, hydrogen atoms 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Those atoms are um, pre-conscious. They are um, consciousness at a prior level of development, but somehow they include it because they became it uh, billions of years later. And so the way our brains are structured and our bodies have evolved is, you know, intimately related to the way reality is. So the fact that our thoughts are embedded in our bodies that our minds are embodied, that philosophy is always in the flesh, is no um, argument against metaphysics. This, this actually is, is sort of saying that thoughts are reality. Your ideas about the world are the world. And they're your brain, your body, and the way it has evolved in this universe. Um, yeah, exactly. And so then we still can wonder about this situation and speculate about its ultimate meaning. Not in order to arrive at some final decision about what that meaning may be. Um, you know, once we've adopted um, an evolutionary cosmology, that includes our, our ideas about the cosmos. We've got to recognize that our system, our thought, uh, our abstract systems must be also in a continual process of generation, regeneration. Um, they must constantly come to know the world um, again as if for the first time. That's what wonder means. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that. I think um, Leakoff and Johnson are, are great, but um, in terms of embodied cognitive science, I'd recommend a book to you, Piro, by um, Francisco Varela and uh, Humberto Maturana, the guys that came up with the biological theory of autopoiesis. They wrote this book, The Tree of Knowledge, The Biological Roots of Human Understanding. And um, I think you'd really like it. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening.